so Marcus has written this wonderful book with this non-controversial title <laughs> called American Taliban that a few of you may have heard of and we'll be talking about the course of the conversation. I wanted to talk first a couple of general things. So one of the things that interests me, at least in this conversation, and hopefully the audience and some of the people we've talked to here, I always ask them, what got you into politics? Did you come out of your mother's wombs talking, thinking politics? Was there an aha moment? Did something in the external world affect you? Was it gradual, sudden? How did it all happen? Yeah, I, I grew up in uh, El Salvador. So uh, in the midst of basically what was an exploding civil war, was there from 76 to 1980. So I was exposed very clearly and very, very early on to uh, sort of the real life and death ramifications of politics uh, because it was, you know, um, it was life and death in El Salvador. Uh, one of the first pictures I have that, that my family has of me, and that, that's not a baby picture, and I think I'm about maybe four years old and I'm reading a newspaper. But it's, but it's upside down, so I'm not. But I thought it was really, cool. apparently I thought it was really cool to read a newspaper. And, uh, and so growing up, uh, I mean, I, if, if I had grown up in this world with the internet and the access to news sources that we have now, I, I never would have left my room. Um, as it was, I never left my room because I was afraid of getting beat up because mm -hmm. I wanted to go to the library to read up on newspapers from around the country. Uh, I had my parents buy <clears throat> subscriptions of both the Chicago Tribune and the Sun Times, not realizing until very later on how expensive that was. My parents didn't have a lot of money, so from, they they clearly saw my interest in this, and they decided to encourage it at a very early, uh, very early age. So yeah, I think from from the very beginning, and I don't know if if growing up in uh, in what was a war zone sort of triggered it, or if it was just an eight, but that that was sort of the genesis of it all. And were there? critical issues. We were talking about this a little before we came in. It's interesting, you know, some people are environmental is their issue. Some people is the war. Some people it's economic disparity. And it's hard to articulate why those issues grab you more than other valid issues. So were there some early on for you that are most prominent? Have they changed over time? Yeah, I was a Republican. Which I'm very uh, this conversation is over. very <laughs> unproud of. I, I actually I helped uh, Dennis Hastert get elected. I, I have a picture of me and George Bush Sr. from a campaign rally where I was working. Did you bring it with you? Uh, I burned it. Oh. <laughs> I don't want that evidence, so I don't want anybody to find out. This is the clip that we this ever happened. To send out. Right. <laughs> and I've been trying to atone for my sins ever since. So uh, there was a question in there somewhere before yeah. I... Uh, your, your, the issues you cared about. Oh, the issues I cared about. Um, being in El Salvador and growing up, I, I was very anti-communist. And uh, because I saw uh, the, the sort of the damage that the guerrilla was, was causing, not to say that the military regime in power was any better, mm -hmm. but from my perspective at the time, I was young, uh, what I saw is, is, is little girls that were going to get water, getting their legs blown off because mines had been laid by a water hole. And it was very ruthless on both sides. And uh, um, so to me, I, I came in from basically an anti-communist. Uh, so I was like, I loved Ronald Reagan because he talked about the evil empire. And that's where I became a, a Republican. But I joined the army, uh, which was the first time that I was not a Republican uh -huh. <laughs> because I wanted to serve my country in uniform. And, uh, and I, that should have tipped me off. So, you know, I spent three years in the Army, and, and I come out still thinking I'm a Republican, and I was struck by just how selfish uh, George Bush Sr., this is 92, was, and uh, how selfish the Republican Party had become. And I just come out from an environment, the Army, which is sort of the ultimate socialized uh, ecosystem, right? They paid for my food, they paid for my, mm -hmm. my, my schooling, they paid for my housing, they paid for my health care, my dental, my eyesight. They paid for everything, and that allowed me and my, and my platoon mates to really focus on the job at hand. We could be the best we could be, and we could serve our country the best we could, because we did not have to worry about surviving. This was all provided to us. So you come from an environment where it's very nurturing and very cohesive to one where everybody was in it for themselves, and it really rubbed me the wrong way. So I voted for George Bush Sr. in 92, and this is how brilliant I am, right? Is that I was a Republican when the Democrats had Congress. <laughs> I flipped in 94, just in time for the Republicans to take power. Right. So I, I, I was in the minority my entire life until uh, 2006, and that felt really good. Mm -hmm. Not so much now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
When did you get the idea to start Daily Kos? Was it, uh, how did that come about? Yeah, Daily Kos, I started in 2002. Uh, I started reading several blogs like MyDD and Atrius was just starting, these sort of pioneer progressive bloggers. And actually, I had a blog in the late 90s when I was in law school. It was called the Hispanic Latino News Service. And if you go there, it's now a porn site because they took the, uh, the <laughs> URL when I let it lapse. But if you go in the Wayback Machine, you can sort of see it. And this was all pure HTML. There was no such thing as Blogspot or blog, you know, any kind of blogging platform. So I would actually HTML, I would code it, and mm -hmm. it would take me three, four hours a day just to build these pages and put them up. Clearly, I had an affinity towards a medium before the medium even existed. When blogging tools came out, I thought, this is fantastic. I can try to do something on my own. And uh, I started really just private site for a couple of weeks to make sure that I, I liked it. And uh, it seemed like, OK, I can do this. So I did it. But this was a time, remember, when the big blogs like Atrus had like 600 daily visitors. <laughs> oh my god, this guy's like huge in a very tiny pond, like a raindrop yeah. of a pond. Yeah. But he's huge. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so nobody started blogging at the time because they thought there was going to be any sort of future in it. It was just a way to get off our frustra frustrations on the way that the political climate had become. And the the growth uh, was that how much of the growth uh, was sort of could you say an organized strategic plan, and how much was just people were desperate for information? And yeah, there's no organized plan. I mean, I just wrote every day. Uh, in fact, I. There's a story, you know, the diaries are sort of a key component of Daily Coast. This allows people to, to write and control their own, you know, and write about what they want to talk about. And it's a very key driver to the growth of Daily Coast. I'm, I'm convinced it's probably the number one reason. Uh, the first growth spurt came because I was an unapologetic, strong, conserv uh, progressive at a time when those things did not exist. I mean, you had Joe Klein on Time Magazine, you know, who's a liberal on Time, saying that everybody knew that Saddam Hussein's a threat and that we should do something about it. And I was like, Really? And like, yeah, well, if you're reasonable, you know that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm reasonable. I don't think that's true. Uh, so you had somebody, and I was a veteran, so I could talk about the military buildup and, and discuss it in a way that most people couldn't. And it was harder for the conservatives to attack me because, uh, you know, I'd served and they hadn't. So, um, <laughs> but the, the diaries, right? Big driver. The story is I, I moved over to this platform called Scoop because the, the comments had become unruly on Daily Coast. People were stealing each other's handles. Uh, it was impossible to moderate. Trolls were, were, were making a total mess. And it was starting to crash from the volume. So I went to Scoop because they had a really robust comment system. Uh, when I put it up, I was like, oh, yeah, that diary thing. I forgot to take that off. I'll take it off later. <laughs> right? And within about three hours, there was already like 16 of them. <laughs> so this is I, I, you know, my brilliant genius is that I was too lazy <laughs> to pay attention to what I was doing. That's great. Um, but don't, don't tell anybody, because. No. Then we won't and make I've, sure it's not on the cameras. I've got to build this mythology this, that I'm a genius yes, and visionary, <laughs> yeah. when I'm really, I'm just lazy. <laughs> Well, based on your output, it's hard to believe that. Let me ask you first about MSNBC, because people here may be interested in that story, and then a few other things. So tell folks what happened and why, and all of those details that you wish to. Yeah, I'm banned from MSNBC. The, uh, the liberal network does not allow me on, because I made Joe Scarborough cry on Twitter, and I won't apologize, because they're apparently running a kindergarten over there. <laughs> um, he was complaining about media bias over the Joe, remember the Joe Sestak non-story about, oh my god, he was offered a job and that's like worse than Watergate. Yes. Uh, I, and uh, it, it was, uh, and he was whining about the media double standard. Imagine if a conservative did that, which of course they did. I mean, we just didn't give a shit because mm -hmm. who cares? Uh, I don't know if anybody, if you guys know this, but he also, at the same time uh, Gary Condit was having his uh, intern problems, uh, Joe Scarborough had one of his staffers mysteriously die in one of his offices. And the coroner's office completely whitewashed it. There was no real investigation. And really, nobody knows exactly what happened. Now, there's no insinuation that Scarborough killed her because he was in Washington, D.C. at the time. So that wasn't the point. But the point is, there wasn't really any insinuations that Gary Condit had kill, killed Sandra Levy either, except that he was a Democrat. And Joe Scarborough was a Republican, so nobody talked about his dead staffer problem while everybody was basically camping out at Gary Condit's house. He was hounded out of polite society, even though he did not kill uh, Shandra Levy. Joe Scarborough has a show on MSNBC. So he's complaining about double standards, and so I, I, I tweet back, like a certain dead intern. And he flipped. Like, I, I think I broke him. I mean, like, his, <laughs> his head exploded. 
he, you, he accused me of accusing him of murder multiple times, and I mean, he went crazy. He went nuts. So he was tweeting. You guys were tweeting up and back. Is that how he yeah. accused you? Yeah. So, or? so people are saying, oh, where did he accuse you of murder? Of course, there was no example. Mm -hmm. So uh, Phil Griffin, the, the president of MSNBC, who, who by the way brought Pat Buchanan on, brought Mark Halperin as senior political analyst at MS, MS, MSNBC. He's a guy who basically is, is desperate to make Joe Scarborough's show work. I mean, this guy is not building a liberal network. There's a myth about the MSNBC liberal network. They have three hours of liberal programming in the evening, just like they have three hours in the morning of conservative programming. And basically he said, well, can you please apologize to Joe Scarborough? He's kind of crying here. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and I sort of like, what, you have fainting couches all around MSNBC? <laughs> so every time you guys get them vapors, you can, you can pass out on your fainting couches? What the hell? Is a kindergarten over there? And since I won't apologize, they won't let me on the air. And is that, did he write that, or you just, has he admitted it? Oh, he's admitted it, it. yeah, he yeah. He has said that, okay. uh, he, he, he issued a statement uh, basically saying that is is some about them being a family and they stick together and yeah, uh, and they stick it together by prohibiting the progressive shows, which are the highest rated, and actually bring the money mm -hmm. into MSNBC, prohibiting them from having the guests that they want to have. I mean, it's really a bizarre situation. And Joe Scarborough's show, for the record, last in morning uh, news cable shows, below headline news. And how lame do you have to be to be below <laughs> headline news? That's the gutter. Headline news is the gutter. So they're like <laughs> under the gutter. Um, and when did you get the idea for this book, American Taliban? American Taliban, uh, I've had this idea for probably the last seven years. I've been writing about it. I think I first wrote about it in 2005 the notion of the American Taliban. Because as progressive, I've been hearing, uh, if I oppose the wars, if I oppose the uh, destruction of habeas corpus, if I oppose the opposite, if I oppose torture, if I oppose the creeping surveillance state, then therefore I want the terrorists to win. If I'm a Democrat, I want the terrorists to win. And I always thought that was so stupid because of the reasons that I wrote this book, because they are both militaristic, and they think that violence is a means to an end and a, a solution to their problems. They want to impose theocracy. They think the word of God should su supersede the US Constitution or any sort of rule of man. Uh, they are hostile to women equality. They don't think they should have an equal role in our society. They, uh, have bizarre hangups about sex, and that's a really good chapter. Uh, yeah. The chapter about violence and theocracy, <laughs> kind of depressing. The chapter on sex, really fun. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk about it a little more for the clip video? Clip? I will <laughs> talk about the chapter of sex. I don't know if you guys yeah. know this, but according to the American Taliban, uh, this is uh, focus on the family, uh, Dobson's operation. Ran a piece that the way to make sure that your sons stay straight is to have them shower with dad because if they see the penis, it'll make them straight. <laughs> there's a, there's a punchline here. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. That's funny, yes, but we're not there yet. The uh, chief of staff of Tom Coburn, who's a senator from Oklahoma, who's in his own right a, a conservative activist, at a, at a conference gave a whole speech about how pornography, like watching a reading Playboy, made boys gay. So according to the American Taliban, the way to become straight is to watch or you know, get a good look at a big penis. Mm -hmm. And a way to get gay is to watch, read Playboy and look at pictures of naked women. Who knew? <laughs> so, so this is, so it's, I mean, and that, that's like one page of an entire chapter of this kind of craziness. I mean, these people are hilarious. But they're funny to laugh at when they're out of power. Yeah. and when they're on the fringe. And that's so funny when they actually have opportunities of winning races all across the country. So there's, there's the, the sex stuff, their culture. I mean, they see culture as a thing that they, they, they try to control it. They already control the media. They already control the political establishment in DC, but they can't control the culture. And suddenly you have a culture that's really pushing things like equality and tolerance and justice and you know, they're outraged. This is horrid. This is like the worst thing that can happen because it's hard to be a bigot when the culture does not allow it. I mean, they want to go back to the era of, the, of Jim Crow South, where you were able to have picnics around lynchings because the society allowed them to express their bigotry in overt ways. Now they can't do that. And then, of course, their hostility towards science and knowledge and education, uh, because anything that contradicts this ideological construct that they had built 
uh, is suspect and liberal and, they, uh, and unacceptable. So that's why they have Fox News and they have Rush Limbaugh to create their alternate world. They have their Bob Jones University and Glenn Beck University to make sure that they don't actually learn anything that's real. Uh, and they're hostile to things like global warming and, and, and so on that, that, that uh, ide are ideologically uh, not incompatible but sort of uh, uh, problematic to, to their notion of, of ideological purity. And when you wrote the book, was there an audience in mind? Was there a goal in mind? Was it meant to be a, an organizing tool? Or was it, or was, is, was it a, an idea that you wanted to communicate to get out into the culture? Well, one is I wanted to make sure that any, anybody who would say that liberals want the terrorists to win, sort of, you know, we, had, we realized that we can push back and say, of course, we don't want them to win. Uh, now, what's interesting is that this has sort of sparked a backlash amongst DC-based progressives who are sort of outraged at how uncivil it is that I would call them the American Taliban because the Taliban are monsters and Americans can never be that way. We can't be monsters. And I don't, I don't buy that American exceptionalism stuff. Like I said, you can go back fairly recent in our past to see that kind of abuses uh, and violence in the South. And, uh, and uh, you know, people probably don't know this, but right now there's a six month shortage on ammunition in this country. If you order ammo, it takes six months to fulfill that. They're hoarding weapons, they're hoarding ammunition, and they're not doing that because they respect democracy and want to have a civil debate. You have their Senate candidate in, in Nevada, Sharon Engel, who's running against Harry Reid, who's recently said that if Republicans don't take back control of Congress, they may have to resort to Second Amendment remedies. So we can sit there and pretend that this doesn't exist, uh, but you don't get to say in a couple years when, uh, when they realize that democracy, that the Tea Party movement, is, it's not a majority movement, that the country does not support them, uh, that democracy is not a way to power because they're so out of the mainstream, and they start shooting people up. They can't go around saying, well, nobody could have predicted. Because that's what they always say, even though the signs are always there, and all you have to do is look at them. And you have these liberals who are afraid to even consider the notion because it's uncivil, when the evidence is clear as day, as far as I can see. And what do you attribute, I mean, you were saying before that they're fun to poke fun at when they're not in power, but now that they're winning primaries and they're going to win some elections. When you started the book, did you believe we'd be, you'd be sitting here one day talking about some of these people winning elections? And what do you attribute it to on a sort of larger level? What are the trends or the issues that have allowed people who clearly are fringe and marginalized in some way uh, to have such electoral success at any rate. Yeah, no, I, I, I knew these guys from the beginning were going to be a, an electoral force. Uh, a lot of people are trying to dismiss them as astroturf, and, and uh, I've been on the other side. You know, the way we built a movement to uh, knock off Joe Lieberman from the Democratic Party in Connecticut. Uh, and we didn't do it just grassroots boots. We had SEIU dump a couple million dollars, and that sort of thing helps. Mm -hmm. So the notion that, well, because Tom DeLay came in and dumped a few million dollars to help him out, that makes it astroturf. It's, it's, it's not true. And I've been on that, like I said, I've been on the other mm -hmm. side. I've seen it happen. Uh, it was clear it was a, a, um, uh, a real movement. And it's also clear that they had in mind what we had in mind, which is to take over the, their party the way we set out to take over the Democratic Party from the Joe Liebermans of the, of the Democratic Party. So what to me is kind of interesting about the Tea Party movement is that they, they, they've always existed. They're Republicans, right? They sort of rebranded themselves, but they're Republicans. They're the Republican base. And the Karl Roves used to be very masterful at manipulating these people. And they used to do so using dog whistle politics, you know, use code words to communicate with them so the rest of America would know you were communicating with them. So now suddenly these guys are getting restless. They figure, well, these Republicans really are using us. They don't care about us and our issues. So we're going to set out to take over the party. And what's great about it is that they don't want to use dog whistle politics, right? They're being as clear as day about it. So you have, uh, you know, it used to be, you know, privatization of Social Security. You know, they're out to destroy it, but oh, we'll privatize it. You know, we're going to empower people to take charge of their retirement. You have a can candidate in Wisconsin named Ron Johnson who's running against Russ Feingold, and he's ahead in the polls. Russ Feingold's not looking very good. Uh, he just ran an ad recently, about a week ago, where he basically looked in the camera and he said, you know, my opponent, Russ Feingold, he's going he's gonna to accuse me of wanting to destroy Social Security. So I'm here to tell you that he's exactly right. I want to end that Ponzi scheme. So, you know, they're all happy because yeah, he's so. finally saying it, you know, Carl Rove's pounding his head on the, on the desk. He's like, what, what's going on here? Which is why he reacted so violently 
angry at Christine O'Donnell when she mm -hmm. went in Delaware because she vocalizes what the Republicans had been trying so hard to keep under the table. And that was fine as long as you can manipulate them, not the, in the inmates in the asylum that are starting to take over. <laughs> They're not so happy anymore. But they are a, a potent force. They're already going to, you know, one of the guys in, in Utah, you know, won the primary, he's basically guaranteed in. Uh, the guy in, in uh, Miller in Alaska is probably going to win. I mean, mm -hmm. things are a little complicated, but he's likely to win. And some of these guys, whether it's Rand Paul in Kentucky or Sharon Engel in Nevada, uh, some of you, you know, they've made those races competitive when Democrats should have been blown out. But competitive doesn't mean we've got it in the bag. Mm -hmm. Some of these guys are going to make it in, and suddenly you're going to have these, these wackos. So even if they don't take back the Senate, you're going to have a few of these guys, uh, lead, you know, with Jim DeMint leading them, basically making very clear what the Republican agenda really is. Not what they pretend that the agenda was, but what it truly is. And I think that's going to have electoral ramifications down the road. This year, we're sort of screwed with the crappy economy and sort of the ineffective Democrats who haven't been able to act on it. I mean, they can't even pass a tax cut for the middle class. I mean, this is how useless they become. But, but uh, long term, uh, I think the, the Tea Party people, they're going to pose a real problem for the Republican Party. I think they already are. Well, uh, talk about that a little bit, because if they're running on, if it's no longer hidden code, if the, Johnson is saying, I'm going to destroy Social Security, why would the long-term ramifications be better for progressives if uh, they're up front about it, they get into office, and then they try to make stuff like that happen? Uh, the reason is because uh, right now, uh, I mean, the, the, the issue with this, debate, this, this cycle is that right now it's a referendum on Obama. And that's why we're getting killed, mostly in the Midwest. I mean, if you look at where it really hurt, and some of the most economically hard-hit areas of the country, uh, particularly Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, Iowa, uh, we're getting crushed, Illinois, we're getting crushed in those states in a lot of those races because of the economic problems. And uh, that sort of notion that it's a referendum insulates a lot of these candidates from actually making it a choice. Mm -hmm. Now, the White House strategy, and it seems to be paying some dividends now because poll numbers have been improving in the last couple of weeks, uh, particularly in the House, uh, is to, to shift that by making it clear, look, these guys can actually win. Mm -hmm. So it's not a referendum anymore. Uh, you got to make a choice. Is this what you truly want? And I think that's going to improve our chances. We're still going to get our asses whooped, but it may not be as catastrophic. We may actually hold the House and the Senate uh, if these trends continue. And, uh, but what happens, of course, is some of these guys are going to get elected. And in the next cycle, when things are a little better, hopefully, things have improved, the economy is a little better off, and people can actually make a more rational choice between the two parties, it's not going to be uh, the, 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 the contrast between the two. It's going to be much starker because, like I said, these guys aren't being shy about what their agenda is. They aren't using code words. Uh, they aren't pretending to be something that they are not. They are completely, they are the most honest Republicans we've ever seen, and that's why it terrifies <laughs> Karl Rove. <laughs> they can run on that, the most honest yeah. Republicans you've ever seen, quote, quote you. And, <laughs> and that's scary. Yes. Uh, um, one of the questions that lots of people have been asking themselves, uh, or in sort of various parts to this question, is, Many people worked incredibly hard for Obama. He promised many things to many people. It's part of getting elected. Once he was elected, looking back on these two years, how do you think uh, progressives or people with strong passion about certain issues could have been more effective? There's no way we could have been less effective um, in putting pressure on or focus or getting him to move on any of these agendas. What could we have done differently since many of these votes and money and hard work helped put him in office? I, I don't know what else we, we could have done. Uh, I, I lay this entirely on the Democrats. I mean, uh, in the Senate, we have a 60-vote um, system that it's basically it's a broken system. Thing is, though, how many of you heard Bill Frist ever complain about 60 votes? Never. He never talked about 60 votes. He talked about the, the, the mandate that Republicans had. We have a majority. And you know what? You vote against this, we're going to run against you hard. We're going to run these votes, and we're going to go to your districts, and we're going we're gonna to F you if you vote against this. And he acted with strength and conviction. First thing Harry Reid did when, he, when 2008, uh, after the election, so I got 59. I ain't got 60. I can't do anything. What can I do? And I know the worst day of his life was when Al Franken was seated. <laughs> it's like, shit, God, now we got to do something. Um, so immediately he, he, he communicated to Republicans that, you know what, it's OK to obstruct because 
I'm going to make excuses. Then you have uh, Obama who comes in, and he seems more concerned about bipartisanship than he is in passing the best legislation for the country. And he's conceding, and they're negotiating against themselves. And they're, and they're hoping, well, what if we make the stimulus half of it tax cuts, which don't do anything to stimulate? But how about that? Will that get your vote? No. They should have pulled back. OK, no tax cuts. Instead, they stayed in. And they gave concessions. So these Republicans would say, well, how about funding this thing in my district? Will you vote for it? No. Well, here's your check anyway. So they'd go into the district with a big paper check, <laughs> bragging about the money they brought to this district when they voted against that legislation. I don't know where they got their negotiating tactics, but it sure was a negotiating 101 because it was, uh, it was incompetent. And you know, I thought people are, oh, Rahm Emanuel is going to be horrible um, as chief of staff. I thought, well, he's got a reputation of busting balls in the House. You know, if he's busting balls in the White House, that'd be a good thing. I never saw it. So when they talk about uh, sh thugs, th you know, sh uh, Chicago thug style of politics, like I wish <laughs> that would have been awesome, but that's not Chicago style of politics. I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> and uh, so it, that that was, you know, you project weakness, and you're so concerned about getting Republican votes instead of saying this legislation is bipartisan because the bipartisan majority of Americans support it. Comprehensive immigration reform, 60 to 70 percent of Republicans support it. The uh, public option for health care, the polls showed about 40% of Republicans supported it. Not a majority, but a significant number of Republicans. That made it bipartisan. Down the list, Republicans in America, not in D.C., in America, <laughs> supported a big chunk of this legislation. That should have been the justification they needed, and that should have been the bipartisan that they should have uh, sought. Instead, they were more worried about Mike Enzi and negotiating in the, in, in the Senate uh, with people who were never going to help and who were openly bragging about obstruction. They were more concerned about them than they were in America, and right now Republic Democrats are going to pay the price for that. Well, one of the things that's become clear, and the Republicans, again, have been very open about this, and it's one area I hope that will, and this may be heresy to some folks, uh, affect liberals and Democrats, which is they're very clear saying, it's okay if we lose an election. We don't want to get, these are the Republicans talking now, we don't want to get shitty candidates in. We don't want to get compromises in. We're prepared to lose this seat. And I think that there's a lot of value in that. It also goes to another core issue, which is this issue of electoral politics versus movement building. Pre-George Bush, we have to go way back to those days, there was a real split. There were people who worked in electoral, and there were people who worked on movement building. And we all know that over a period of time, movement building has been the most successful for bringing real change, the women's movement, the peace movement, the civil rights movement. That all disappeared with Bush because he was so hated. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering whether you would, um, how you would f think or feel about a notion of we need some more movement building not just everyone focused on winning each individual House district or Senate district as we go forward. Yeah, one of the things that I love about, just from a movement building standpoint, in the last decade is that we've gotten away from sort of the women's movement and the environmentalist mm -hmm. movement. And starting with Move On, I think they were sort of the pioneers, which yeah. was a more holistic yes. approach to movement building. It wasn't my issue, it was Everyone's. Yep. what we all seek. Mm -hmm. Because we all sort of agree, generally speaking, we may tinker on yep. the edges, but we generally agree with the environmentalist agenda and, and, and labor. And, mm -hmm. uh, so why sit there and, and fight over your turf uh, when we could work together? Republicans have mastered it. That's why you have the NRA talking about tax cuts and you have the Christian Coalition talking about gun control. So you have Move On. Then you had sort of the blogosphere rise, which was very much a holistic uh, mm -hmm. movement. Uh, you had the rise of Center for American Progress and Media Matters and, and some of these organizations uh, that again, you know, and, and of course, brave new films that, of course, that were more focused on the broader movement because we're all in this together and we have to stick together. And I think that's part of our strength in 2006 mm -hmm. and 8. Is, is one of the reasons we won is because we were very holistic in our movement building. Uh, I, I don't think you can separate the the electoral component because that's sort of the that's the game, that's a score, that's how you score touchdowns in this in in this world, right? Is you you win elections, uh, but clearly. It's, this is very early on. I mean, you got to look at the conservatives and what they built. It took him 16 years to win the White House, from, from Barry Goldwater losing in 64 to 1980. It took him 30 years to win back Congress, right? And now, over the last four decades, they had this incredible media and, uh, and think tank machine and political machine that uh, just crushes anything we have. 
we are competitive because they've been incompetent and because people don't like Republicans. But they're still in the game despite those things. And uh, so I can't, you know, we can't sit there and say, well, we've been building ours for six years and it's been a failure, right? We've only been building ours for six years. We don't have anything near approaching parity. And I don't want to spend 16 years to reach parity. But, you know, we also have to realize that this is a long-term process. And if we fail in taking out Joe Lieberman once, it's going to take six years before we get our second crack. And we're going to get our second crack in 12. And he's gone. He's gone, he's gone, he's gone. We got rid of Blanche Lincoln this year, one way or another. She's gone. So little by little, we start getting rid of the bad ones. We elect more people like Al Franken. We protect the good ones we have, like Russ Feingold and Barbara Boxer. And, uh, and realize, you know, uh, like a daily, because what we say is that our motto is more and better Democrats. When we can do more, we'll focus on more. If we can do better, we'll try to get better. And this is a long-term process. And fact is, we have a lot of really good Democrats in the House and the Senate. And it's really, sometimes it's easy to forget that because we hate the Ben Nelsons and the Max Baucuses. And they ruin it for everybody because they obstruct good legislation. I mean, they're the ones that ultimately uh, killed good health care and killed good uh, finance reform. Uh, but we can't forget that because of those jerk d Democrats that there isn't a core of really solid and good Democrats. And what we need to do is we need to get them reinforcements uh, to, to be able to carry on the fight. I mean, we're going to lose ground this year. But if we lose 25 blue dogs in November, that's a good night for us. <laughs> if we lose Alan Grayson and Russ Feingold, that's a bad night for us. And that's the key. That's why I think we have to work, not to save those 25 blue dogs, because they're going to lose, is to save the good ones. Because we don't have enough, we need more, and we have to protect the ones we already have. Great, and the last quick question, um, and they're signaling our time. <clears throat> you could have, if you could wave the magic wand 2011 and do one thing, other than your children, uh, if it was politically oriented, what, is there a piece of legislation, a candidate, something, what would you want to happen in 2011? What I want to happen in 2011 more than anything else is for Joe Lieberman to announce that he's running for re-election. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want him to take the easy way out. Great. I want him to be fired by the voters. Okay. So I am terrified of him retiring. Okay. So we have to start a campaign that Joe should run again in 2012. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay.